of interpretation of normal awake EEG. Specifically, we will briefly review some of the technical aspects that are important for the recording of routine EEG. We will also review some of the elements of a normal alpha rhythm, and we will briefly review some other normal variants. It is best to look at a routine EEG first by taking a careful look at the first artifact-free page. Here, we can see a small amount of artifact in the back of the head at P7, but other than that, this page is relatively free of artifact and is a good starting point. In many ways, you can generate a preliminary EEG report by looking at a single artifact-free epoch. In this case, we are looking at a 10-second sample of normal wakefulness. Subsequent epochs simply serve to modify this report, changing your interpretation of what you have already described before. Many novice EEGers make the mistake of forging ahead without looking carefully at a single epoch of EEG, and in this way much information is missed. First, we will start briefly by looking at the technical aspects of this EEG. In this EEG software, the technical parameters can be seen in a bar at the top of the page. You can see that the low frequency filter is set to 1 Hz. This is reviewed in much greater detail in a previous video, but this is an appropriate level for looking at a normal wakefulness. You can see that if we toggle this menu, there are many other options which can dramatically change how our EEG looks. The high frequency filter is set at 70 Hz, which again is appropriate for normal wakefulness. Importantly, the notch filter is off. As mentioned in a previous video, having the notch filter off is very important so that you do not miss electrodes that may have abnormally high impedance and therefore are not connected to the head. By having the notch filter on during initial recording, you may be missing important data about the technical quality of your recording. The sensitivity here is at 7 microvolts per millimeter. Increasing the sensitivity can give the impression that this recording is abnormally high voltage. Similarly, decreasing the sensitivity can give the false impression that this patient has a low voltage recording. The normal sensitivity for reading adult EEG is generally 7 microvolts per millimeter. You may have to adjust the sensitivity in children who generally have a higher voltage EEG background. Finally, we look at the time base which in this case is set so that we see approximately 10 seconds in a single epoch. You can see what happens if we change the time.
this video, we will review EEG in normal sleep. Specifically, we will look at different stages of normal sleep and look at the components of each of these stages, including drowsiness, stage 1 sleep, stage 2 sleep, slow wave sleep, and REM sleep. In order to understand the progression into different stages of sleep, it is useful to first start with normal wakefulness. This is a patient with a normal background EEG during wakefulness. There are several clues that this patient is awake, which we have reviewed in prior videos. You can see prominent myogenic artifact in the frontal and temporal regions on both sides. This is likely related to summated compound muscle action potentials from the frontalis and temporalis muscles, which have some ongoing tone during wakefulness. In addition, best seen in the posterior aspects of the midline electrodes, there is a normal posterior dominant rhythm, or alpha rhythm. In this case, the alpha rhythm is 11 hertz, which is well within the normal range. Thirdly, we can see some eye movements, including an eye blink here, and a quick horizontal eye movement here at the end of the page. All of this suggests normal wakefulness, likely with eyes closed, at least initially. As we scroll forward, we can see some eye opening with prominent eye movements, more muscle artifact, and a blocking of the posterior dominant rhythm. As we move forward, we see some eye closure, and the posterior dominant rhythm becomes more augmented and easier to see. Then, over the next 10 or 15 seconds, we start to see a few changes. First, we see decreased myogenic or muscle artifact, which might suggest that this patient is relaxing, and possibly going into a decreased state of arousal. This is one of the earliest indications that drowsiness might be starting. The second very prominent thing that we can see on this recording are prominent, very slow undulations within the temporal change bilaterally. If you look carefully at any particular second, you can see that there is a large electropositivity at F7, and at the same time, there is a large electronegativity at F8. We have reviewed eye movements in a previous video, but this would suggest that the positively charged cornea is causing positive deflection at F7 on the left side, and there is a negatively charged retina causing negatively charged deflection at F8 on the right side. And so this is an eye movement to the left. Judging by the rate of change and the time course of this undulation, which takes between two and three seconds, these eye movements are slow. These are slow rolling eye movements, which are a normal manifestation of drowsiness. As we move forward, we can see the alpha rhythm begins to drop out. Compare the first half of this page to the second half, and you can see that while there is a reasonably well-developed alpha rhythm in the first half of the page, this is not seen very well in the second half. Another thing that you are starting to see in the second half of the page is some excessive theta activity. This is probably best appreciated in some of the midline electrodes, such as right here. So to review, some of the earliest signs of drowsiness or early sleep include decreased muscle or myogenic artifact, slow rolling horizontal eye movements, loss of the normal alpha rhythm, and excessive theta activity. As you begin to read EEGs, you will see that there will be some fluctuations in the rate of drowsiness, and it is uncommon for people to drop off to full sleep right away. Often, as on this page, you will see some deeper drowsiness, which is interspersed with some bursts of diffuse, higher frequency activity seen on the second half of the page. Here, I have moved forward several epochs two or three minutes later into the stage of sleep you can notice that there is much less muscle artifact, suggesting that the patient is in a deeper stage of restfulness. You can also notice that there is no posterior dominant alpha rhythm, and there is much less higher frequency alpha and beta activity than we saw on previous parts of this recording. In addition, I would like to focus your attention to the posterior aspect of the head, where we see several slightly sharply contoured waveforms, which I will point out here. You can see that these waveforms have a sharp contour, and they are upwardly deflected in the posterior channels of each chain. This would suggest that they are either electronegative more anteriorly, 
or they are electropositive posteriorly. We can sort this out further by changing montages. Here, I have switched to an average reference montage. If we look at the same waveform on the right side, we can see that there is a downward deflection at O2 with reference to the average, suggested that this is a waveform with positive polarity maximal in the occipital region. If we think about the elements of these waveforms, we can come up with the name of this particular phenomena. These have positive polarity, they are maximal in the occipital region, they are sharply contoured transients, and they are occurring during sleep. If we put this together, we can see that these are posts. Posts are normally seen in stage 1 or early sleep, although they can persist into stage 2 sleep as well. Posts are often the first indication that a patient is transitioning from drowsiness to stage 1 sleep. You might have noticed when thinking about the normal wakefulness video that posts have a very similar morphology to lambda waves, except that they occur during sleep. Although the exact generator of posts is unknown, patients with prominent lambda waves often have prominent posts. It is useful to think about posts as the sleep state correlate of lambda waves, as they have very similar morphology, location, and polarity. I have switched to the EEG of another patient for a better clearer example of the next common stage 1 sleep transient. Again, we know that this patient is asleep for several reasons, including the absence of prominent myogenic artifact, the absence of any normal, clear, well-modulated posterior dominant rhythm, and the presence of sleep transients. I would focus your attention to the center of this screen. You can see that there are slightly high voltage, sharply contoured waveforms occurring in a run, which are best seen in the central chains, both on the left, on the right, and in the midline. You can see that the quote-unquote phase reversal, or maximum negativity, for these sharply contoured waveforms occurs at C3, CZ, and C4. Again, this confirms that these are sharply contoured waveforms which have negative polarity and are maximal in the central part of the head, also known as the vertex. These waveforms are called vertex sharp waves, and they are often seen in late stage 1 sleep and can persist throughout stage 2 sleep as well. I have switched to a transverse montage to demonstrate that these waveforms are best seen in the center of the head. On this transverse montage, the central chain of electrodes goes from left to right across the center of the head, and you can see that the vertex sharp waves are highest voltage in this region. It is often useful to look at sleep using a transverse montage, as many other sleep transients, as you will see, are maximal in the central head region. I have switched the montage again, this time to an average reference montage, simply to confirm that these waveforms are highest voltage and negatively charged at CZ, C3, and C4, aka the vertex region of the head. To summarize, the two main components of stage 1 sleep are posts and vertex waves. I have returned to our first patient to demonstrate the next sleep transient that is important to recognize. Again, focus your attention to the center of this screen. Here, you can see a relatively high voltage, relatively broadly contoured, long duration waveform that is frontal and central maximal with a relatively diffuse field. This high voltage waveform has two large phases, but these waveforms can often have more phases. Here, we see an initial high voltage negativity followed by a subsequent positivity. In addition, superimposed on this waveform, you can see some high-frequency, fast activity. All of the characteristics I described are characteristics of a K-complex. A K-complex is one of the two characteristic findings seen during stage 2 sleep. Here is another example of a more complicated K-complex, which you can see has several phases. The origin of the name of K-complex is, is the subject of some dispute. However, there is some evidence to suggest that the K might stand for knock. K 
K-complexes are generated during arousals and often generated during external stimulation, such as when a technologist knocks on the wall or the door, it is common to see K-complexes preceding an arousal. If you look at this part of the sleep recording, you can see that there is a string of two K-complexes that then precede an arousal, which is indicated by the increased muscle artifact and the loss of sleep transients. Here, I have switched to a transverse montage, which, as I said before, can be a useful way of looking at sleep transients, which are often maximal in the midline. You can see that the K-complex has a slightly different location than the vertex waves, which were maximal at CZ. These K-complexes are slightly more frontal maximal, although they do have a broad field. Here, we can see the other main component of stage 2 sleep, focusing again on the center of the page. You see a rhythm lasting approximately one to one and a half seconds, consisting of undulating 14 hertz rhythm, maximal in the center of the head. This is a sleep spindle. Sleep spindles are the other hallmark of stage two sleep. To summarize the components of spindles, they are usually medium voltage, midline maximal, and have a duration of at least half a second and usually one to one and a half seconds and a frequency of 11 to 15 hertz usually averaging 12 to 14 hertz. This is a routine EEG during sleep in a normal nine-month-old baby. You can see in the center of the page another sleep spindle. In this case the spindle is maximal at C3, CZ, and C4. If we look forward in this child, we can see that at times, the spindles are either maximal on one side, as seen here, or on the other side, as seen here. These are what are called asynchronous sleep spindles, which is a normal phenomenon between the ages of 3 months and 18 months. Some degree of asynchronous spindles can also be seen up to 2 years of age. The other thing to notice about these spindles is that they are much longer than sleep spindles in adults. In this case, this spindle lasts almost three seconds. Some EEG learners have used the word asymmetric rather than asynchronous, but the major distinguishing factor is that asymmetric would suggest that the spindles are either exclusively or almost always seen on one side of the head and not on the other. Asynchronous spindles should be seen in approximately equal quantities on both sides of the head, but at any one time, they might be maximal on one side of the head or the other. So to summarize, the two major components of stage 2 sleep are spindles and K-complexes. As we scroll forward, we can start to identify some of these sleep transients coexisting in this stage 2 sleep recording. At the start of the page, we see a K-complex. As we move forward, we see a slightly bluntly contoured vertex wave. Near the end of the page, we see a run of posts. And then we see some spindles superimposed on some delta activity. The posts can occur in rhythmic runs, which sometimes appear sharply contoured. At the end of the page, the vertex wave can appear more sharply contoured than on previous examples. And sometimes the spindles can be less well developed and have a broader feel extending into the frontal head regions. I have switched back to the recording of the other patient to show a later stage of sleep. On this recording, you do not see vertex waves, K-complexes, or spindles, but there is no muscle artifact, and this patient is asleep. Here, what you do see are diffuse, that is, they affect the entire head, high voltage, slow frequency delta activity with some superimposed higher frequency alpha and beta activity. You can see that this higher voltage delta activity predominates during this entire epoch. This is what's called slow wave sleep, previously called stage 3 and stage 4 sleep. This is a deeper stage of sleep than the stage 1 or 2 that we saw previously. By definition, slow wave sleep is defined when greater than 20% of the sleep background is predominated by high voltage delta activity. Finally, we have reached the stage of sleep which we will discuss last. Here, in comparison to the slow wave sleep, you can see that the background is much lower voltage and that the main waveforms seen are in the alpha and beta range, perhaps seen best when focusing on the midline. 
In addition, there is very little or almost no muscle artifact. Finally, we see some very complicated eye movements which have both a horizontal and vertical component. We can see that they have a horizontal component because there is an opposite polarity in the right and left temporal region, for example, looking at this particular eye movement. We can see that they have a vertical component because there is a synchronous deflection in the frontal polar region on the left and the right. Therefore, we would call these oblique eye movements. If you look at this set of three eye movements, you can see that they are all in slightly different directions because they all have slightly different polarity in the temporal and frontal regions. You can also see that the initial eye deflection is very quick, lasting only about 100 milliseconds. Therefore, we can conclude that this patient is having rapid, slightly chaotic, oblique eye movements. Taken together with the fact that we know this patient is asleep and that there is very little muscle or movement artifact, we would conclude that this patient is in rapid eye movement sleep or REM sleep. Many EEGers have difficulty distinguishing REM sleep from wakefulness, but I would point out that there is no normal anterior to posterior gradient of the alpha rhythm, there is no muscle, and the eye movements are somewhat complex and therefore are less likely to represent voluntary eye movements. To summarize, we have reviewed the five different stages of normal sleep, including drowsiness, stage one, stage two, slow wave sleep, and REM sleep. Being aware of the normal components of sleep allows us to recognize abnormalities, which will be reviewed in subsequent videos. In this video, we will review the important aspects of interpretation of normal awake EEG. Specifically, we will briefly review some of the technical aspects that are important for the recording of routine EEG. We will also review some of the elements of a normal alpha rhythm, and we will briefly review some other normal variants. It is best to look at a routine EEG first by taking a careful look at the first artifact-free page. Here we can see a small amount of artifact in the back of the head at P7, but other than that, this page is relatively free of artifact and is a good starting point. In many ways, you can generate a preliminary EEG report by looking at a single artifact-free epoch. In this case, we are looking at a 10-second sample of normal wakefulness. Subsequent epochs simply serve to modify this report, changing your interpretation of what you have already described before. Many novice EEGers make the mistake of forging ahead without looking carefully at a single epoch of EEG, and in this way, much information is missed. First, we will start briefly by looking at the technical aspects of this EEG. In this EEG software, the technical parameters can be seen in a bar at the top of the page. You can see that the low frequency filter is set to 1 Hz. This is reviewed in much greater detail in a previous video, but this is an appropriate level for looking at a normal wakefulness. You can see that if we toggle this menu, there are many other options which could dramatically change how our EEG looks. The high frequency filter is set at 70 Hz, which again is appropriate for normal wakefulness. Importantly, the notch filter is off. As mentioned in a previous video, having the notch filter off is very important so that you do not miss electrodes that may have abnormally high impedance and therefore are not connected to the head. By having the notch filter on during initial recording, you may be missing important data about the technical quality of your recording. The sensitivity here is at 7 microvolts per millimeter. Increasing the sensitivity can give the impression that this recording is abnormally high voltage. Similarly, decreasing the sensitivity can give the false impression that this patient has a low voltage recording. The normal sensitivity for reading adult EEG is generally 7 microvolts per millimeter. You may have to adjust the sensitivity in children who generally have a higher voltage EEG background. Finally, we look at the time base, which in this case is set so that we see approximately 10 seconds in a single epoch. You can see what happens if we change the time base to increase the number of seconds in a single epoch. The background seems abnormally high frequency or fast. Next, we have to look at the montage, 
This is an anterior posterior bipolar montage, which is a common montage for reading routine EEG. We have discussed some of the strengths and weaknesses of montages in a separate video, and I would refer back to this for additional details. To review briefly, we start with left temporal, then left parasagittal, then midline, then right parasagittal, then right temporal, and a single EKG recording. As we become more advanced in our EEG interpretation, we can change the montage settings to suit our specific needs. Now that we have carefully looked at the technical aspects and reviewed the montage, we can begin to identify and interpret the alpha rhythm. On this epoch, you can see that there are three main segments. I would focus your gaze towards the posterior aspects of the head. You can see that there is a relatively high frequency oscillating pattern, which is then interrupted for the middle four seconds and then re-emerges. This is the alpha rhythm. We have reviewed eye movements in a separate video. Here we see a large upward deflection or negative polarity at the front of the head in FP1 and FP2. This would suggest that the eyeballs with their positively charged cornea are moving downward, and this is actually eye opening. The high frequency activity in the back of the head, which is the alpha rhythm, has been blocked with eye opening. Here, later in the recording, we see a large downward or positive deflection. In this case, this is due to eye closure with Bell's phenomenon and the positively charged cornea moving up closer to the forehead. You can see that the alpha rhythm re-emerges with eye closure. The characteristic of the alpha rhythm which makes it augment or become higher voltage with eye closure and attenuate or become lower voltage with eye opening is known as reactivity. Therefore, we can report that in this recording we have a reactive alpha rhythm. Next, we will look at the frequency of the alpha rhythm. The best way to measure the frequency of the alpha rhythm is by looking at one second of artifact-free recording with the eyes closed as I have outlined here. Looking carefully at this segment, we can see that the frequency is 11 Hz, and we have our second characteristic of the alpha rhythm. This is a histogram showing the range of alpha frequency on the horizontal axis and the percent of normal subjects with this alpha frequency on the vertical axis. You can see in this study that more than 95% of normal subjects have an alpha rhythm that lies within the range of 8.5 to 12. Therefore, an alpha rhythm would likely be considered abnormal if it was below 8.5 Hz or above 12 Hz. After looking at the frequency of the alpha rhythm, we can explore its amplitude. As I have discussed in previous videos, there are no absolutes in EEG, as we are always comparing the signal at one position to the signal at another. Therefore, we can never get a completely accurate sense of the amplitude. However, in general, the amplitude seen on a referential montage gives a much better sense of the absolute amplitude in any particular head region in comparison to the amplitude on a bipolar montage when we are looking at the differences between adjacent electrodes. Therefore, on this EEG, we will switch to the average reference montage and review the amplitude of the alpha rhythm using this montage. As well as switching the montage, I have also inserted a scale legend, which we will use to estimate the amplitude of the alpha rhythm. Here I have placed the scale legend next to the O2 channel, and will measure the amplitude by looking at the total deflection from lowest point to highest point. In this situation, the deflection from lowest to highest point takes up approximately one-third of the scale legend, which would mean that the amplitude of this alpha rhythm is somewhere between 40 and 50 microvolts. The normal amplitude for an alpha rhythm in an awake adult is between 20 and 50 microvolts, and so we can say that this patient has a normal voltage alpha rhythm. Thus, we have been able to add one further characteristic to our description of the alpha rhythm in that it has a normal voltage between 40 and 50 microvolts. It is common for the amplitude of the alpha rhythm to vary throughout the recording, and so in the report I would recommend outlining a range of amplitudes in which the alpha rhythm most often fits. Next we will look at the symmetry of the alpha rhythm. To do this, we have to shift our scale legend to the left hemisphere and measure the amplitude of the alpha rhythm on the left. Here I have put the scale legend adjacent to O1, 
you can see that if we measure the amplitude from the lowest to highest point on the waveform, it takes up approximately one quarter of the scale legend. Therefore, the amplitude is approximately 30 to 40 microvolts. Going back, now we have a sense of symmetry. The amplitude is between 30 and 40 microvolts on the left side and between 40 and 50 microvolts on the right. In general, we say that it is still a normal level of asymmetry as long as the difference in amplitude is less than 50% on a referential montage. As well, the amplitude of the alpha rhythm is generally higher voltage on the right side compared to the left. Although there are several theoretical explanations for that, there is no conclusive evidence to explain why this is the case. As with the amplitude, the level of symmetry can vary from epoch to epoch. Therefore, it is important to look at the entire recording before making any definitive conclusions about asymmetry. Now, we have a fourth characteristic of the alpha rhythm that we can add to our report. The alpha rhythm is reactive, it has an 11 hertz frequency, the amplitude is between 30 and 50 microvolts, and there is a normal degree of asymmetry. The right is the higher voltage than the left, but this is less than 50%. One final component of the alpha rhythm that we should comment on is its distribution. In general, in a normal adult, the alpha rhythm is maximal in the posterior head regions, particularly the occipital electrode contacts. We can see that this is the case in our patient. In some cases, the alpha rhythm is termed the posterior dominant rhythm for this reason. Therefore, based on a careful look at a single epoch of routine EEG, we can obtain a huge amount of information about the alpha rhythm. Here are a few other characteristics of the alpha rhythm. It is, as we said, between 8.5 and 12 hertz in most individuals, and an alpha frequency less than 8 hertz throughout an entire recording would be considered abnormal. The alpha rhythm is generally constant within an individual. There can be some variability. It can slow down by as much as 1 hertz during drowsiness, and it can slow down with older age. The alpha frequency generally increases in frequency through childhood and reaches peak frequency in adolescence or early adulthood. Finally, we will conclude our discussion of normal awake EEG by focusing on three common normal variants called alpha squeak, mu rhythm, and lambda waves. First, we will look at alpha squeak. We will remain on the same epoch of normal awake recording that we have been analyzing throughout this video so far. Focus your attention on the second half of this video with the second instance of eye closure. Initially, for the first 0.5 to 1 seconds after eye closure, the rhythm in the posterior aspect of the head is much faster than the normal 11 Hz alpha rhythm. It is approximately twice as fast before returning to the normal 11 Hz baseline. This is called alpha squeak. This name dates back to the era of paper EEG recording. At that time, EEG was recorded on paper with multiple pens being deflected at the same time. If the pens were deflected up and down very quickly, secondary to a high frequency brain rhythm, they would generate a squeaking sound as they moved across the paper. Hence, alpha squeak. I have chosen an epoch of awake EEG from another patient in order to better demonstrate lambda waves. You can see that this EEG epoch is organized in an anterior-posterior bipolar montage. And if we look at the state, there are a couple of clues that this patient is awake with their eyes open. One clue that the patient is awake is that there is prominent myogenic artifact in the frontal and temporal regions suggesting active muscle tone in the facial and jaw muscles, which is more prominent during wakefulness. In addition, we see numerous eye blinks, which would suggest that this patient has their eyes open and is blinking. The lambda waves can be seen throughout this epoch in the posterior head regions, shown here. If we look more carefully at these lambda waves, we can see that they are fairly simply configured with two phases. Therefore, we would call them diphasic. Superficially, they resemble a Greek letter lambda, which is how they get their name. Second, we can see that they are maximal in the back of the head. Third, we can look carefully at their polarity. Again, we see that there is an initial upward deflection 
at P701, P301, P402, and P802. Going back to our polarity rules, this would suggest that these waveforms are either electronegative at P7, P3, P4, and P8, or they are electropositive at O1 and O2. Because there is no evidence of these waveforms more anteriorly, the most parsimonious explanation is that these are electropositive at O1 and O2. To convince you further, I have switched to an average reference montage, and you can see that these waveforms now have a downward deflection in the O1 and O2 channels with reference to the rest of the head. This provides further evidence that these are electropositive waveforms. The exact generator of lambda waves is not completely understood, but they are generated by inspection of complex visual patterns. During routine EEGs, lambda waves are often generated by inspection of the dots on a ceiling tile, for example. In our experience, during video EEG recording on inpatients, we often see lambda waves when patients are examining complex visual patterns on computer laptops, for example. Regardless, lambda waves are most prominent when the eyes are open. I have moved forward in this recording, and we still see some lambda waves. But if we move forward one more epoch, we can see that this patient slowly closes their eyes, and the alpha rhythm emerges in the posterior aspect of the head, replacing lambda waves. Therefore, we note that lambda waves are blocked by eye closure. Let's go back to our original patient and choose another epoch to look at carefully, this time focusing on the last element we will discuss in this video, the mu rhythm. Here we have another example of an awake recording, again a clue being the prominent myogenic artifact in the frontal and temporal regions. We can also see that this patient likely has their eyes opened, as we have prominent blink artifacts. We do not see much of an alpha rhythm, which is not surprising considering this patient's eyes are open. What we do see in the parasagittal region, particularly on the right side, is a rhythm that is maximal at C4. Let's look at this more carefully. This is the mu rhythm. We can see several characteristics of this rhythm. First, it has a very prominent arch shape. This superficially resembles the Greek letter mu, and this is how it gets its name. Next, we can look at the frequency. In this case, the frequency is approximately 10 or 11 hertz, or very close to the alpha frequency. In general, the frequency of the mu rhythm is very similar to the alpha frequency. The mu rhythm is thought to be generated by the sensory motor cortex at rest. Interestingly, the mu rhythm is most prominent when the patient has their limbs at rest. The mu rhythm can be blocked by movement of the contralateral limb or, interestingly enough, even by a thought of moving the contralateral limb. Mu rhythm is often seen on one side or the other and can be seen synchronously in both hemispheres. The mu rhythm is generally more prominent when the patient's eyes are open possibly because the alpha rhythm blocks the mu rhythm during eye closure. This concludes our review of the normal awake EEG. We have looked at the technical aspects of awake EEG, normal alpha rhythm, and some other normal variants. In subsequent videos, we will look at normal sleep, other normal variants, and then some abnormalities. In this video, we will review the basics of interictal epileptiform discharges. Specifically, we will look at a few of the most important characteristics of focal epileptiform discharges, and then we will briefly review one type of generalized epileptiform discharge. Hopefully, this will provide a basis for some further learning about epileptiform discharges and epilepsy in EEG. It is important to remember a principle that a normal EEG does not rule out epilepsy. In general, if an EEG is done very quickly after a first convulsion, the likelihood of finding interictal epileptiform abnormalities is about 50%. However, if an EEG is done later than that, the likelihood drops. Prolonged EEG recording and several routine EEGs can increase the likelihood of finding epileptiform discharges in patients with epilepsy, but there are some patients who will never have interictal epileptiform abnormalities on interictal EEG.
In order to understand why, we can look at a coronal section of a normal brain. For the purpose of illustration, I will place the approximate positions of some scalp electrodes. The likelihood of finding an abnormality on scalp is dependent on two main factors. The area of the cortex involved and the location of the abnormal activity. If there is focal synchronous abnormal neuronal discharges, which would normally generate interictal epileptiform activity, but it involves only a small area, as demonstrated by this red star, then this may not be seen by the overlying scalp EEG recording, whereas a larger area of cortex involved might be easily seen on scalp EEG. Studies that have looked at the correlation between scalp and intracranial EEG recording have shown that 10 to 20 square centimeters of cortex must be involved in order to consistently see interictal epileptiform abnormalities on scalp EEG. This means that a fairly large area of brain has to be involved in order for us to see it. The second consideration is the location of the abnormality. I have indicated an abnormality in a superficial aspect of the right frontal lobe, very close to overlying scalp EEG electrodes. You can imagine that abnormal electrical activity in the cingulate gyrus, in the mesial temporal structures, or in the insula might not generate the same sorts of potentials on the scalp. I have chosen this study to look very carefully at the characteristics of an epileptiform discharge. To review briefly, this is an anterior-posterior bipolar montage, except in this case we have some additional electrodes. Starting from the top, we have a left inferior temporal chain, then the regular left temporal chain, then a left parasagittal chain, then midline, then right parasagittal, then right temporal, and then right inferior temporal. I have moved the most prominent abnormality towards the center of the page, and you can see it here in the left temporal and inferior temporal region. This is a focal left temporal sharp wave. We will go through a few of the characteristics of a focal epileptiform discharge. In general, the same rules apply when you are looking at any focal epileptiform discharge. First, I will decrease the sensitivity so we can get a better sense of this discharge. Remember that now I have the sensitivity at 30 microvolts per millimeter which gives us the false impression that this is a low voltage discharge when in fact it is very high voltage. The first characteristic of a focal epileptiform discharge is that it is sharply contoured. In general, this means that it must be less than 200 milliseconds in duration. There is an arbitrary distinction between sharp waves and spikes in that sharp waves are less than 200 milliseconds while spikes are even sharper and less than 70 milliseconds in duration. Although this distinction is made, and we often categorize discharges in this way, from a practical perspective, there does not seem to be any difference in the biological significance of a spike versus a sharp wave. The second characteristic is that this discharge has multiple phases. If we look very carefully at this discharge, focusing on one of the channels, we can see that there's actually an initial positive phase, then the largest negative phase, then a third positive phase, so that we would call this a three-phase or triphasic discharge. However, it is important to distinguish this from triphasic waves, which have a different clinical significance. This discharge should interrupt the background. In other words, it should not simply look like a continuation of normal background activity. We can see that this discharge clearly stands out from the background, and there is a disruption in the background before and after the sharpest component of this discharge. In general, there should be an aftercoming slow wave after epileptiform discharges. Again, we can see this here, here, and here. Finally, there should be a field that makes sense. We have reviewed polarity rules in a different recording, but you can see that there is a downward deflection at F P1, F9, a relatively flat recording at F9, T9, and an upward deflection at T9, P9. This would suggest that the maximal negativity is at F9, T9. Similarly, in the regular temporal chain, we see a downward deflection at FP1, F7, and an upward deflection at F7, T7, suggesting that this is electronegative at F7. Therefore, we would say that this is a sharp wave 
or Sharpet's low wave complex, with maximal negativity at F9, F7, and T9. When we switch to an average reference montage, our suspicion that this was maximal electric negativity at F7, F9, and T9 is confirmed. When we focus on the entire page, we actually see that we have a similar abnormality on the right side, although it is not quite as high voltage. Here we can see at a maximal electronegativity at F10, T10, and to a lesser extent F8 and T8. This is also sharply contoured, also has multiple phases, also interrupts the background, is also associated with an aftercoming slow wave, and also has a field that makes sense. This is a right anterior temporal sharp wave. Therefore, on this single page, we have independent bitemporal anterior temporal sharp waves. I have chosen a recording from a different patient to show you a slightly different focal epileptiform discharge. This discharge follows all of the rules we have established for focal epileptiform discharges. It is sharply contoured. There are multiple phases. There is a disruption of the background rhythm. There is a large aftercoming slow wave, perhaps best seen in the posterior temporal region, and there is a field that makes sense. Let us carefully go through the field as this discharge looks slightly different than the others on anterior-posterior bipolar montage. I will decrease the sensitivity, and if we look carefully, we can see that there is a large downward deflection at P402 and C4P4. This would suggest that this is either electropositive at P4 and C4, or alternatively electronegative at O2. Considering most epileptiform discharges are electronegative in nature, this is most likely electronegative at O2. If we look in the temporal chain, we see that there is a downward deflection at T8P8 and an upward deflection at P8O2. This would suggest that there is also a negativity at P8. Therefore, this discharge is maximal in the posterior temporal and occipital region. When we switch to an average reference montage, we indeed see that this discharge has a maximal electronegativity at P8 and O2. This discharge also has a very nice example of a classic high voltage after coming slow wave. This is an example of a very different type of epileptiform abnormality. Note that the sensitivity on this study has been decreased dramatically to 50 microvolts per millimeter. For the sake of perspective, I will increase the sensitivity up to the usual 7 or 10 microvolts per millimeter. And you can see how high voltage these abnormalities are. Decreasing the sensitivity back down allows us to look more carefully at these discharges. On first blush, you can see that the discharges appear to involve most of the head, and therefore we would call this a run of generalized epileptiform discharges. All of the same rules that we saw with focal epileptiform discharges apply, however. If we zoom in on the left central region, we can see that these discharges are sharply contoured. There is clearly a disruption of the background. There are multiple phases. There are large high voltage after coming slow waves. And as said before, there is a field that makes sense, although in this case, the field is very diffuse. With this set of discharges, we can see that the changes in phase, and therefore the maximum negativity, are at C3, Cz, and C4, with some involvement of the frontal head regions as well. Therefore, we would say that these are maximal in the bilateral frontal central regions. You can see that these discharges come in runs. Initially, for the first second, the frequency is approximately 3.5 hertz or so. Gradually, as we move towards the end of the page, the frequency decreases slightly to between 2.5 and, and 3 hertz. These are 3 hertz generalized spike wave discharges, which are seen most commonly in childhood absence epilepsy, but can be seen in other types of seizure disorders as well. If we scroll forward slowly, we can see that this run of discharges continues for a long time before a gradual offset. Considering the duration of this run of discharges, which is approximately 15 seconds, we would expect that there would be some subtle alteration in level of consciousness. One of the major distinguishing factors between focal and generalized epileptiform discharges 
is that runs of generalized epileptiform discharges constitute the EEG correlate of clinical seizures. The significance of focal epileptiform discharges and how they connect to seizures is less clearly understood. In this video, we have reviewed the basic concepts of both focal and generalized epileptiform discharges. Obviously, the characteristics and biology of these discharges is far more complicated than has been demonstrated here, but hopefully this provides a basis for further learning. In this video, we will look at focal slowing and attenuation. There are several important considerations when looking at focal slowing and attenuation. It is important to recognize and document the location. Does it involve a region or the entire hemisphere? The frequency. Is it mainly theta activity, delta activity, or is there a mixture of frequencies? Is the slowing continuous or intermittent? And is it rhythmic or polymorphic? These elements of focal slowing can be helpful in determining the possible clinical significance of the abnormalities. We will review several examples of focal abnormalities in this video, and you will see that there is a broad range of focal abnormalities on EEG with an even broader range of clinical correlation. Mild intermittent focal slowing can be one of the most difficult EEG abnormalities to identify. While recognition of mild intermittent focal slowing is often very easy for the experienced eeg -er, this is often the source of a lot of confusion and frustration for people learning how to read EEG. This is an anterior-posterior bipolar montage with left hemisphere on the top, midline electrodes in the middle, and right hemisphere on the bottom. This patient has some mild intermittent focal slowing, mainly in the theta range. This may be difficult to see at first, but I will provide you with some recommendations on how to look at an EEG in order to identify these sorts of abnormalities. When you are first reading EEG, one of the best things that you can do is simplify your reading by going second by second through the page. In each second, it is a good idea to compare analogous head regions. For example, in the first second of this page, we can compare the left temporal region to the right temporal region. Already, we get the hint that there might be a slight difference between these two regions. In the anterior temporal regions on the left side, there is a hint of a theta or delta wave, which we do not see in the analogous region on the right. Moving forward a few seconds, take a look at the left temporal region in this three seconds. Again, compare it to the analogous head region on the other side. Here we can see that there are several waveforms in the theta and delta range that we see on the left, especially in the left anterior temporal region, that we do not see on the right. Therefore, we can say that there is some focal slowing or some focal polymorphic, i.e. not rhythmic, theta and delta activity in the left temporal region not seen on the right. This is an indication of some mild focal cerebral dysfunction, but it is a very nonspecific finding that can be seen in a lot of disorders. Here I have switched to an average reference montage. As I have mentioned in previous videos, it is sometimes easier to see focal slowing on average reference montage as opposed to bipolar montages. Again, look at this string of three seconds and compare the left temporal region to the right temporal region. Particularly, compare F7 and T7 to F8 and T8. You can clearly see that there are some medium voltage theta and delta waves on the left side that are not seen on the right. This is the same patient during drowsiness or light sleep. Here you can see that there are clearly high voltage delta waves intermittently in the left hemisphere, maximal in the left frontal and temporal regions, that are not seen in analogous head regions on the right. As you look for focal slowing, it will take a long time to review a routine EEG recording. However, with experience, you will become more proficient at recognition of patterns, and it will be easier to screen for this focal slowing. Here is a slightly different example of focal slowing or focal cerebral dysfunction, but again, the same approach works. Starting with the first one or two seconds, compare analogous head regions on one side and then the other. If we do this for the first few seconds of this recording, we can see that there is a nice alpha rhythm on the left side, and on the right side we do not see much of an alpha rhythm, and instead we see polymorphic, i.e. non-rhythmic, delta and theta activity. 
This seems to be most prominent in the temporal region, but also extends to the parasagittal region as well. If we continue across the page, comparing left to right, we can see that rather than being intermittent, as with the last recording, this slowing is continuous. Therefore, we would conclude that this patient has continuous polymorphic theta and delta activity in the right hemisphere, maximal in the right temporal region. This suggests more significant focal cerebral dysfunction and can be seen in clinical scenarios such as a focal structural abnormality like stroke or tumor or postictally. It is important to remember that focal polymorphic delta activity could represent a postictal phenomenon. For example, if a patient comes in with unexplained decreased consciousness, has normal imaging in a normal exam, but has focal polymorphic delta activity, it could be that they had a seizure prior to the EEG being connected. This is actually the case in this patient's scenario. This patient had completely normal neuroimaging, but had unexplained altered consciousness, and it was later found that this patient had localization-related epilepsy arising from the right hemisphere. After 24 hours, his EEG normalized, and he has been well-controlled with no further seizures while taking anti-epileptic drugs. Here is yet another example of focal slowing. We can see that this slowing is on the left side of the head and seems to be most prominent in the left temporal region. On this montage, I have included the inferior temporal electrode chains here on the left and here on the right. You can see that there is continuous focal delta activity in the left hemisphere. And you can see as opposed to the prior recordings, this activity is quite rhythmic at about two or two and a half hertz. Therefore, we would call this lateralized rhythmic delta activity. Rhythmic delta activity might indicate a slightly higher predisposition towards seizures, and therefore these patients need to be watched carefully. This recording was taken in a patient with temporal lobe epilepsy. Here is this patient's MRI, where you can see a very small atrophic hippocampus on the left side. This patient has epilepsy due to left mesial temporal sclerosis. This is one of my favorite teaching EEGs because it shows an entire clinical story on one page. Again, the organization here is left hemisphere on the top, midline in the middle, and right hemisphere on the bottom. Comparing left to right, second by second, we can see that there is a significant difference between the left hemisphere and the right, whereas there is both theta and alpha activity in the right hemisphere, we do not really see very much alpha activity on the left. This suggests that there is some attenuation of faster activity. Instead, we see this very slow delta activity at a rate of one or two hertz with some superimposed theta activity, although not nearly as well developed as on the right. Therefore, we would say that there is focal cerebral dysfunction on the left manifested as focal polymorphic slowing and focal or lateralized attenuation. Let's look at some of the other features of the CEG that are not nearly as obvious. Here you can see that there is very prominent muscle activity in the left temporal region, and we see almost no muscle activity in the analogous right temporal region. This would suggest that some of the muscles in the right temporal region, such as the temporalis muscle and some of the facial muscles, are activated on the left, but are not activated on the right. If we look in the second half of the page, we do see that there is some muscle artifact in the FP1 and FP2 channels on both sides, and therefore the frontalis muscle is likely functioning fairly well on both sides. Therefore, we can conclude that this patient probably has some temporalis and possibly lower facial muscle weakness on the right side. Putting it all together, you could say that perhaps this patient has a lower motor neuron facial weakness on the right, due to cerebral dysfunction on the left. Finally, if we look at the EKG tracing, we can see that we have an irregularly irregular tracing with no obvious P waves prior to the QRS complexes. Although we cannot make any definitive conclusions about the EKG rhythm, we might suspect that this patient could be in atrial fibrillation. Putting it all together, this patient has left hemispheric dysfunction on EEG, right facial weakness, more in the temporalis than frontalis muscles, which suggests upper motor neuron facial weakness, and possible atrial fibrillation. One might conclude that this person had an embolic left hemispheric infarction due to atrial fibrillation, producing right upper motor neuron facial weakness. 
This is this patient's CT scan, and here you can see that there is an evolving infarction in the left MCA territory. Here is one last example of a focal abnormality. Again, comparing left to right, we can see that there is some polymorphic slowing in the left hemisphere that we do not see on the right, particularly in the left temporal region as, composed, as compared to the right. In addition, we see that there is higher voltage of some of the faster activity in the alpha and beta range in the left posterior head region as opposed to the right. This is a breach artifact. I have drawn this very crude diagram of a brain in order to illustrate the breach artifact. This is the brain. This is the skull. We will put an imaginary EEG electrode here. Low frequency waveforms generated by the cortex have an easier time passing through a dense object such as the skull, and so all of these are seen easily by the EEG electrodes. Higher frequency waveforms in the beta and higher range have a more difficult time traveling through the dense skull, and so these are seen at lower amplitude and less prominently than lower frequency waveforms. Now I have put a break in the skull here if we have an electrode adjacent to this region, higher frequency waveforms pass more easily through the breach in the skull than they do through the intact skull. So in the particular part of the head where there is a breach in the skull, you will have more prominent high frequency activity as we saw in the preceding example. A more concrete example of how a dense object is a high frequency filter is to think about the bathroom door at a music club. When you are in a music club, you hear a mixture of both high and low pitched frequencies. However, when you go to the bathroom, usually you only hear the thumping of the bass, the low frequency, after you close the door. When you are finished and open the door, all of a sudden high frequency becomes more obvious. In a similar way, the skull acts like the bathroom door, filtering out some of the high frequencies and leaving only low frequencies. When there is a breach, it is as if the door is open in one particular place, and so high frequencies leak out and are seen more easily. This patient has a prior craniotomy in the left parietal occipital region, and this explains the excess of high frequency activity in this region. In this video, we have reviewed several examples of focal slowing and attenuation and their clinical significance. To review, it is important to remember the location, the predominant frequency, whether or not it was continuous or intermittent, and whether or not it was rhythmic or polymorphic. This is meant to be an introduction to focal abnormalities, and you will see that this video showed just the tip of the iceberg of focal abnormalities on EEG. In this video, we will review diffuse or generalized slowing or disruption of the background, as well as periodic discharges. Diffuse or generalized slowing and attenuation is often arbitrarily graded as mild, moderate, or severe. However, there are no standardized grading systems to determine these degrees of severity. Rather, each encephalographer uses his or her own internal criteria to determine the severity of the disruption of the background rhythm. Some indicators of severity or dysfunction include the frequency, is it predominantly theta or predominantly delta frequency? The organization, is there an anterior or posterior gradient? And are there other indications of normal organization of the background rhythm? Is the background continuous? And is there reactivity? Diffuse slowing, like focal slowing, can also be rhythmic or polymorphic. We will review several examples of diffuse background slowing and attenuation in order for you to get an appreciation of the range of diffuse abnormalities and how they relate to clinical disease. Here is an example of generalized or diffuse slowing, taking the same approach as with focal abnormalities if we compare the left side of the head to the right, we can see that there is no significant difference in the amount of theta, delta, or alpha activity on one side compared to the other. There is a bit more muscle artifact on the right side compared to the left, but that can fluctuate from time to time and can be asymmetric in any given patient. It may be helpful to demonstrate this recording on one side of the screen and a segment of normal EEG on the other side of the screen. Let's look at some of the things that show us that this is diffuse slowing. As opposed to the normal alpha activity seen here in normal wakefulness, which is maximal in the posterior head regions, 
we see diffuse theta and some delta activity, which is approximately the same on the front of the head as opposed to the back. In addition, the dominant background frequency is theta, perhaps best seen in these regions and these regions, in the range of approximately 4 to 6 hertz. Compare this to the normal EEG, where the predominant frequency is in the 10 to 12 hertz range, seen best in the posterior aspect of the head. Therefore, we would say that this patient likely has mild to moderate diffuse cerebral dysfunction manifesting as mild to moderate diffuse slowing of brain activity on EEG. There are several indications of increasing diffuse cerebral dysfunction. Here we have a recording where the predominant background frequency is in the delta range at one or one and a half hertz, as opposed to the previous patient who had background frequency with both delta and theta activity. This might suggest a more severe variant of diffuse, nonspecific cerebral dysfunction. As encephalopathy or cerebral dysfunction progresses, the background can become discontinuous as seen here. We have bursts of cerebral activity with mixed frequencies, including delta, theta, and alpha frequency, alternating with periods of diffuse background flattening or suppression. We would call this a discontinuous or burst suppression pattern. This pattern, again, is nonspecific and can indicate severe underlying brain dysfunction, although this pattern could also be induced with high doses of sedating medications. On the most severe end, you see diffuse attenuation. Here we have virtually no identifiable background brain activity, despite the fact that our sensitivity is at 5 microvolts per millimeter. Very low background activity might not be able to be picked up with routine EEG recordings, but we can say that this is at least diffusely attenuated, if not isoelectric. Again, this can be seen with severe brain dysfunction, but can also be seen after the administration of high doses of sedating medications. Diffuse attenuation can also be seen temporarily in the postictal period, especially after generalized seizures. There are several different types of periodic discharges. There are generalized periodic discharges, which involve both hemispheres simultaneously. There are lateralized periodic discharges, which are also known as periodic lateralized epileptiform discharges or PLEDs. And there are bilateral independent periodic discharges, also known as bilateral independent periodic lateralized epileptiform discharges, or biplets. We will review examples of all three of these types of periodic discharges, and we'll also review the relationship between these discharges and clinical disease. Here is an example of generalized periodic discharges. You can see that there are regular, sharply contoured discharges occurring approximately once a second. They are maximal in the frontal regions bilaterally. If we look very carefully at some of these discharges, we can see that they have a very characteristic morphology. For example, if we look at this discharge in the F4-C4 channel, we can see that there is an initial negative deflection, followed by a very large, broad, positive deflection, followed by a third lower voltage but still broad negative deflection. We would call these generalized periodic discharges with a triphasic morphology because of these three phases. Traditionally, these would be known as triphasic waves, which were often seen in metabolic encephalopathy, such as renal or hepatic encephalopathy. However, we know that generalized periodic discharges are a nonspecific finding and can be associated both with encephalopathy and with a predisposition towards seizures. Here is another example of generalized periodic discharges. You can see that on the left half of the page, for the first several seconds, there are no clear generalized discharges. Then the discharges appear on the second half of the page. Again, they are sharply contoured, have a triphasic morphology, and occur at approximately one discharge per second, or one hertz. What we also notice is in the second half of the page, there is some increased muscle artifact in the temporal chains. This likely means that this patient has been stimulated or is undergoing an arousal. Therefore, we would say that these could be stimulus-induced discharges, which is a common finding in encephalopathic patients. Here is another example of generalized periodic discharges, just to give you a sense of the broad range of discharges that can be seen on EEG. Here, the background EEG is diffusely suppressed with minimal activity in between these discharges. 
The discharges themselves are very high voltage and very sharply contoured. In this particular scenario, this patient has had a cardiac arrest and has developed diffuse cerebral dysfunction expressed as the diffuse suppression of background activity and also has diffuse cortical irritability expressed in the high voltage sharply contoured generalized periodic discharges. For the sake of contrast, I will show another example of generalized periodic discharges. These discharges are difficult to see until I point them out. Again, they are 1 hertz, but they are much less sharply contoured and significantly lower voltage. In fact, they barely stand up from the background. This might suggest that this patient has a diffuse encephalopathy with some predisposition towards cortical irritability. The exact clinical significance of generalized periodic discharges is unclear and most likely depends strongly on the underlying clinical scenario. This is an example of lateralized periodic discharges, also known as LPDs, or periodic lateralized epileptiform discharges, or PLEDs. Again, we are in an anterior-posterior bipolar montage with left-sided electrodes on the top, midline electrodes in the middle, and right-sided electrodes on the bottom. Here you can see that there is a clear distinction between the left and the right sides of the head. On the left side, there are sharply contoured, complex, high voltage discharges occurring approximately every second or two in a very periodic or regular pattern. To some extent, these discharges have a broad field that extends into the right hemisphere, but they are clearly maximal on the left. Lateralized periodic discharges indicate significant focal cortical hyperexcitability on the side or in the location of their maximal activity, and there is a strong association between lateralized periodic discharges and subsequent seizures on prolonged recording. Therefore, when these discharges are seen, additional recording should be done to ensure that the patient does not develop non-convulsive seizures. There are a number of etiologies that can cause lateralized periodic discharges, and they are relatively nonspecific. They can be seen after acute stroke, which is likely the most common cause. They can also be seen in infectious encephalitis, such as in herpes simplex encephalitis. And they can be seen in patients with known underlying epilepsy who have developed status epilepticus or recurrent frequent seizures. If we scroll forward in this patient, we can see how these lateralized periodic discharges evolve. On this page, we see the lateralized periodic discharges for the first few seconds. And then we see that the discharges become closer together. Gradually, you see very rhythmic activity emerging, maximal in the posterior parts of the head on the left. You can see that this becomes extremely rhythmic by the end of the page. If we move forward one page, we see that we have rhythmic activity, which is gradually becoming higher voltage, is evolving in complexity, and this represents an electrographic seizure. Moving forward, we see that this seizure evolves. On the first part of the page, the frequency of the seizure is relatively high, in the high theta or low alpha range. Later, near the end of the page, we can see that the frequency slows down to the low theta or delta range. Gradually, as we move forward, there are changes in the morphology, frequency, and amplitude of this rhythm. The rhythm becomes lower frequency but higher voltage, continues to slow in terms of frequency, and then gradually stops. At the end of the seizure, we see that there is a re-emergence of the lateralized periodic discharges. Again, one of the most important considerations is that when you see lateralized periodic discharges, you should continue to record the patient to ensure that they do not develop electrographic seizures. We will look at one more relatively rare periodic pattern. Here, if we look at the left side only, you can see that there are discharges that appear periodically every second or half or so, maximal in the back of the head, highlighted here in red. Now, if we look at the right side, we can see that there are also periodic discharges in the back of the head, highlighted in blue, but these do not line up at all with the periodic discharges on the left. This pattern is known as bilateral independent periodic discharges or bilateral independent PLEDs. This pattern suggests both cortical hyperexcitability or irritability and significant cerebral dysfunction to the point that there is a disconnection between this activity on one side compared to the other. Bipleds or bipds are uncommon but generally indicate severe cerebral dysfunction and depending on the etiology can be associated with a very poor neurological prognosis.
In this video, I have provided an introduction to diffuse slowing and periodic discharges. As you can see, there as you can see, there is a broad range of expressions of both of these types of abnormalities, and I encourage you to continue reading EEG to get a full sense of the broad range of abnormalities that can be seen.